Um, okay, so just first, uh, quickly regarding the uh, the first quiz. Um, I know that um, this was that this was a difficult one. Um, that most of you didn't do so hot on it, um, but like don't get discouraged because you didn't. Right? Um, remember that this is just the first of twelve. Each of them is only worth one point out of ten. We're going to drop the lowest two grades. And even if you don't do so hot on one, then you're, as long as you answered some questions correctly, you're still getting some points, right? So the impact these have on your grade is relatively small, as long as you only flub a couple of them. Um, I also understand that because you were looking at multiple texts last time, that, that probably made the quiz a little bit harder. So again, like just think of this as a kind of practice quiz, right? that is intended to kind of get you into the groove of what kind of questions you'll be asked on future quizzes. And you know, provided you do better on future quizzes, then you know, whatever grade you've got on this will likely go away. Right? So it's been my general experience that by about the second or third quiz, everybody is usually getting a 75 or better. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. That's what we're shooting for, right? Um, but again, like you know, the, it's it's key that everybody keeps up with the reading in order to do that. Um, so uh, a couple more things, right? So everybody knows Friday response paper two is going to be due, right? Remember to complete the vocabulary quiz Sunday by midnight. And again, remember what I want on the vocabulary quizzes, right? Give me the definition. Give me the name of a relevant text, and the name of the author of that text, right? And for Monday, you're going to be reading um, the excerpts in the slave trade section by Olauda Equiano and Mary Prince. Yeah, Nick. Uh, you got the page numbers wrong for Equiano. I did? Uh, yes, yeah, 104 to 112. Oh, so it is. Yeah. I don't know how I managed that. Well, those are the page numbers for today's. Yeah. Yeah, I must have been looking at the wrong thing. Um, yeah, okay. Yep, you're right. So yeah, so what we're going to be looking at next time um, are uh, black autobiographies of the late 18th and early 19th centuries that discuss people's experiences in the slave trade directly. Um, today, what we are looking at are works composed by um, two white abolitionists and one uh, white defender of the slave trade, whose, co whose politics on that issue and on many others are actually quite complicated. Um, so, right, so, this is, we're, we're, so we're, we're gonna be studying this stuff over uh, two class periods, right? And this is gonna be a recurring theme throughout the course. Um, essentially what I want us to do is a version of what the literary crit uh, critic Edward Said called contrapuntal reading. And contrapuntal reading is reading with an awareness of unstated background, right? So a big part of the background to British literature of the late 18th, early 19th centuries is the, tra uh, the transatlantic slave trade, right? Not just the trade itself, but all of the things that it propped up. This is also why we focused on things in the early uh, sessions of the course, like Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, 
and <clears throat> notions of sensibility and sympathy, right? I want us to be aware as we're reading of the way all of these cultural strands coming together, right? The emergence of the public sphere, even. Affects literary culture, even when these things aren't specifically mentioned, right? So, an example of this with a non-literary subject, or remember we talked about those Nelson's pillars last time that went up all over uh, British dominions in the 19th century, right? And that those Nelson's pillars, you know, present this kind of uncomplicated picture of a naval hero and don't make any reference to the slave system that propped the British Navy up, right? Or the system of impressment um, in which uh, British recruiters uh, went into villages or stopped ships on the seas and just impressed sailors into service, right? You know, congratulations, son, you're a member of the British Navy now, whether you want to be or not, right? That knowledge of those things, right, changes the way we look at that monument, changes the way we read that historical subject, right? So this is what our aim is going to be with most of the texts that we're going to be reading throughout the course, right? So does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? Yeah, Danielle. I don't know if it's technically about this. I'm sure that we'll have to do it on the response paper too. But for the response paper, which uh -huh. takes some of the covering? Anything that we looked at this week, right? So you can do anything from the Romanticism and War section, even if we didn't directly talk about it in class. Um, and you can do any of the three uh, pieces that we read for today, right? And you want the same guidelines as before? This is yep. Text instructions are yep. Instructions are going to be the same all semester. Yep. Any other questions about assignments or contrapuntal reading or anything else? Yeah, go ahead. In our reading that we did for today. Mm hmm. It says an unstated background. Okay. I know that you just said kind of what it was built off of. Yeah. In our readings that we did, it's kind of already stated. Well, yeah, and, and so what I'm giving you now is the background, right? Okay. So this is going to be the background to a lot of the stuff we're going to be looking at um, over the next couple of weeks, right? We're basically kind of starting with deep background stuff. And that's going to lead us into um, this kind of reading. So don't worry about being able to do this with what you read for today. Because, yeah, as you said, um, the arguments are pretty, pretty explicitly stated, right? Um, a lot of this is about bringing people's attention to particular issues. Other questions? We good? Okay. So the piece of music that I was playing at the beginning of class um, was only recently unearthed. Um, a couple of years ago, um, some researchers were going through the papers of an abolitionist by the name of Granville Sharp. in the archives of the city of Gloucester. Gloucester, which of course, like a lot of British place names, is not spelled anywhere near the way you would actually say it, right? Gloucester. Um, and <clears throat> musicologists worked to reconstruct what the song would have sounded like. And you probably noticed that what we ended up with was something in between a regular rhythmic work song and a lament, right? You know, it's a slow, mournful kind of tune, as well as one that is designed to kind of keep up the rhythm of a work pace on a sugar plantation. 
And it's key to remember how important sugar was economically in Britain in the 18th century, in Europe period in the 18th century, um, because sugar is the big British slave crop. So what, if anything, do we know about sugar or about cane farming? Okay, yeah, that people in Europe, at least, you know, like in 18th century Europe loved cane sugar, right? There was a craze for this stuff, in part because it doesn't grow in Europe, right? You can't grow sugar cane in Europe. Um, it is not a native crop. Um, it's not that sugar was unknown in Europe prior to the 18th century. But the only kind of sugar you can grow in Europe comes from beets and is of an inferior quality. So cane sugar is much better, and it's a much more efficient crop than uh, sugar beets are. You can grow a lot more sugar cane on less land. Um, and it's also kind of like important symbolically, right? Because you know we're we're getting this popular sweetener from a process that is designed to brutalize and degrade human beings. Um, a process in which you know, people are killed, maimed, and injured, right? Cane farming is difficult, you know, it's efficient, you can grow a lot of cane on very little land, but it's also difficult and dangerous, right? Which was one of the reasons they used slave workers primarily to do it. Now, how many of you are familiar with the concept of the Atlantic Trade Triangle? Okay, uh, one or two of you are raising your hands. So what do you guys know about the Atlantic Trade Triangle? Maybe who sees the three places. Yep. Yep, three basic points on the map here, right? For our purposes, the apex of the triangle is England, right? English ships go to Africa, loaded with manufactured goods, including but not limited to weapons and alcohol. They go to Africa, they pick up gold, ivory, spices, and slaves. They go to the West Indies, where they pick up sugar and rum. And then back to England with that sugar in rum. Now, this triangle um, was originally initiated by the Portuguese in the 16th century. So the Atlantic slave, slave trade begins with Portuguese merchants in the 16th century looking for bonded labor to work uh, their plantations in Brazil. And as European colonization of the Americas um, gathers steam, so too does the slave trade, to the point where um, major European institutions are heavily invested in it, including the British royal family, right, who not only funded 
the planting of colonists in the Carolinas and then later in Georgia, but also directly invested in slave trading companies and the missionary arm of the Church of England. Right? The church itself was implicated in the slave trade. They were funding these um, <clears throat> trading missions as well, investing in them. In fact, the first major capital, uh, like capitalist financial bubble in England, the so-called South Sea Bubble, Do you guys know what a financial bubble is? This is a word that uh, we hear a lot thrown around in the news, right? But do any of you actually know what a bubble is in economics? Okay. So a bubble is essentially when the price of a commodity is inflated beyond its real monetary value. So like in the late 90s when I was in college, there was a dot-com bubble, right? There were all of these different like internet companies just popping up all over the place. Most of them didn't actually do anything, um, but people were buying up these dot-com stocks that you know, created this bubble that inflated the prices of those stocks, and then the bubble burst and a lot of people lost a lot of money, right? Um, there was that housing bubble in 2008, right? The price of real estate uh, went up and up and up in ways that wasn't sustainable. And then the bubble burst and a lot of people lost all the money they put into their houses, right? So the South Sea bubble in 1720 came from over-enthusiastic investing in the slave trade. Now, <clears throat> this didn't mean that the trade was over or that it didn't recover pretty quickly. Um, but what this does give us some indication of is like just how deeply embedded in British economics this became, right? To give you another example of this, how many of you have heard of Barclays Bank? It's one of the largest private banking institutions in Britain, and really in the world. Um, they own, uh, or, they, they have, or they have the naming rights to a great big arena in Brooklyn where the Brooklyn Nets play basketball, the Barclays Center. This bank is founded by two brothers who made their money in the slave trade and who then went into banking after 1807, when the slave trade was abolished in England. So <clears throat> the reason I tell you all of this, right, is just to give you some sense of how deeply embedded in society all of this was. And yet at the same time, it's often um, treated in the uh, literature and popular culture of the period as completely invisible. In large part because um, there were relatively few slaves in Britain proper. It's in the West Indies or in the American colonies where people don't usually have to look at it. And the West Indian planters, uh, who had representation in Parliament, or at least were able to purchase the votes of members of Parliament, um, tended to paint a very rosy picture of what things looked like here. Right? Oh no, slaves don't want freedom. They're happier as they are. We provide for them. Everything's great. Just trust us, right? Just listen to us. Now, they had two reasons for wanting to paint a rosy picture. The first being economic, right? They want to prop up their own business interests. And the second being security. Because the number of slaves 
in the West Indies vastly out, like, was vastly greater than the number of white planters, right? So they had a real fear that if slavery was abolished, that was going to be not just the end of their plantations, but the end of them. So, <clears throat> Um, Sorry, what did you say that second, the second reason was? Uh, security. Um, essentially security. because, yeah, um, black people in the West Indies who were enslaved vastly outnumbered the white people who had enslaved them. Um, yeah, so yeah, there, there, there was a definite uh, so, yeah, question of, of you know, numbers there, right? You know, the, this notion that if we let them go, um, then we're not safe. So slavery is abolished, or the slave trade is abolished, throughout British dominions in 1807. Now, I put abolished here in little scare quotes, because the fact that the trade itself is legally abolished doesn't mean that slavery goes away. What happens is, in, like embedded in the law, is an apprenticeship. Clause. That means that just because the trade is abolished doesn't mean that those who are already enslaved are suddenly free. They are still bound to their, pre, their former masters as apprentices for a certain number of years. So the person who owns them, even though maybe they don't technically own them anymore, they're still required to give that person a certain number of years of further labor. And this goes on really until about the early 1830s, right? So. Slavery doesn't really end in British dominions until 1832 with the passage of a reform bill that we'll talk about a little later. Like essentially what happens is that this reform bill reduces the political power of the West Indian planters. And so um, as a result, uh, their interests become less important to the functioning of government. Um, so people can ignore them safely. Uh, but, um, you know, so it's a, whole, it's a full 25 years from the legal abolition of slavery to the actual abolition of slavery. And even then, bonded labor doesn't end in British dominions. They find a new source of it. They bring people of the lower social classes um, of India into the Caribbean and into other places to do the kind of work um, that uh, slaves had been doing for little or no pay on these kind these contracts that kind of amount to a form of slavery. So this whole system is really deeply ingrained in British political and economic life, right? And in British cultural life. Now, <clears throat> there were abolitionists, most of them associated um, with what are called the dissenting religious traditions in Britain. Does anybody know what this means, what a dissenter is? Did we talk about this? I remember we talked about um, uh, the relationship of, of Catholics to the government. Yeah, Jamal. Is it like business Yeah, dissent usually uh, indicates uh, not associating with official authority in some way, right? So dissenters are Protestants who are not members of the Church of England. 
So what we say a non C of E Charlotte. Yeah, the, the usual British slang term for the uh, the Church of England is C of E. So anytime I put that abbreviation on the board, that's what I mean. So Church C of E is Church of England. So Presbyterians in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, um, Baptists and Methodists in England. Yeah, essentially, anybody who comes from a Protestant religious tradition but is not a member of the Church of England, right? And dissenters were also um, kind of left out of government and often um, they weren't discriminated against to the same extent the Catholics were, but they did experience some level of discrimination. Um, so people like uh, Granville Sharp and William Wilberforce All right, now these were influential men of money and property in England uh, who used much of that influence uh, to try to bring an end to the slave trade. And they had a lot of enemies as well, people like William Cobb, we'll talk about why um, sort of as we go through some of this stuff. Um, but um, let's... Uh, Pause a moment, like first let's see if anybody has any questions about anything. Is everybody good? Is anybody confused on any point here? Yeah, go ahead, Jamal. Not about this, but about the reading. Okay. Okay, so the last one with Cobbett? Yeah. In there, that makes sense. Okay. Um, what uh, didn't make sense is you, you didn't understand it, or didn't make sense is well, yeah. his argument seemed like bullshit. Kind of both, because like, he acknowledges <laughs> that it's wrong and everything, and then he just uh -huh. starts talking about France. And just, I don't know. It feels like he's just trying to use that as a justification, even though they hate the French. Yeah, and Co Cobbett's actual, William Cobbett's actual politics are really complicated, right? So, William Cobbett is a farmer a journalist, and later in his career, a member of parliament. Now, judging from what you read in that piece, what political um, what political persuasion would you think he represents? Yeah, he sounds like a hardcore right winger, right? Now, what makes him sound conservative in that piece? He's very much against the liberal ideas that have been tossed around by abolition. Okay, yeah, he's anti-abolition, right? What else suggests conservatism um, in his attitudes? The French okay, yeah, it's anti-French too, right? So there's a nationalist element to this. It's an anti-abolitionist, it's nationalist. Yeah, and he's yeah he's he's using scripture as the basis for his arguments, right? Right, something traditionally conservatives have been more likely to do than liberals. Um, so would it surprise you to know that when he was elected to parliament? Cobbett was elected, or Cobbett voted with not the conservatives, not the liberals, but the radical faction in Parliament. The faction that would develop into um, what became a kind of hard left. 
that then eventually evolved into the modern Labour Party. That doesn't surprise me, Simon. I'm not sure if I read it correctly, but I got a sense of distaste for the way that they were treated, that slaves were treated. So, uh, like I said, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm reading it correctly. Okay. Get, uh, point, point, me to, point me to a passage here. Uh -huh. The notable discovery of the inhumanity and injustice of the slave trade. So okay. So I think what we need to do is look at that in the context of that whole quoted passage, right? Um, what does he say in the paragraph above that? Can I get somebody to read that for us? You know, never, like, I'll read it because I realize that, like, a lot of the stuff he's saying is kind of uncomfortable, and I don't want any of you to have to put that in. Okay, so he says, if the purchasing of slaves be now inhuman and unjust, it must always have been so. And the keeping persons in slavery so unjustly acquired must have been equally so. And your lordship must either allow the purchase and possession of slaves to be consistent with the law of God, unless you can show when that law was abrogated, or acknowledge that the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, saints, confessors, fathers, and bishops of the Church of God, both under the law and the gospel, who have purchased, sold, or possessed slaves, bondmen and bondmaids, have acted with cruelty, oppression, inhumanity, and injustice. Such an opinion would be directly contrary to those doctrines which your lordship teaches, and which you and Mr. Wilberforce profess to believe. This notable discovery of the inhumanity and injustice of the slave trade has never been made until the present era of anarchy and confusion, where an impious man have presumed to set up their own ideas of humanity and justice in contradiction to the laws of God as the standard of perfection. So what is the argument he's trying to make about whether slavery is just or unjust here? Yeah, he's, he's, he's saying it in an ironic way, right? It's like, well, if that was inhuman and just then, now, it must have always been so, right? And are you going to say that all of the biblical, biblical patriarchs who owned slaves were unjust men, right? Are you going to say that all of the bishops of the church who have owned slaves were unjust and impious, right? Yes. And see, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we, we can say that, right? And he probably ought to have said that. But he's actually making the opposite argument, right? He's suggesting that this is a product of our current era of anarchy and confusion, right? That people are getting mixed up about their place in the world and no longer recognizing where it is they belong. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Um, I guess, like, to be more like... That's kind of more vague, but like um, uh -huh. when I see the last paragraph, it's like really when um, I put all that together, like uh -huh. when he's saying like, how are you going to rebel what God said in the scriptures? Like uh -huh. and even in that one, uh, the other paragraph that we just read, he says, yeah. like, show me where um, these rules are made. I mean, because I don't really say that. Like yeah. the Bible it just says, yeah. be his righteous to man. Mm -hmm. And like everybody's working underneath somebody else, but he's using that against them and saying, yeah, or against his argument to say, like, no one should rebel against the word um, just because the scriptures have said that. Yeah, he's setting that up as this kind of ultimate authority, right? And it's like, well, if nobody says anything bad about it in the Bible, right? and the patriarchs are just allowed to go on holding slaves and doing whatever, right? Then it should be okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so yeah, he, he's attacking the abolitionist movements as an attack then on faith, right? In particular, an attack on the Church of England. Right, because there is a strong nationalist bent to this as well, right? Now, Cobbett was heavily involved 
in passing this 1832 reform bill, which um, expanded the vote, which expanded voting rights, um, and destroyed uh, most of what were called the rotten boroughs. Did I, did I explain the rotten boroughs to you guys before? You guys before? Do you remember what those were? Yeah, because like because so few people could vote anyway, right? Yeah, these rotten boroughs were these electoral districts where there were really only one or two people who could vote. And so they just colluded among themselves to get someone into parliament who would represent their interests, right? Um, so yeah, Cobbett was uh, a big force behind getting these rotten boroughs abolished. Um, he was very much interested uh, in the rights of British workers um, and in making sure that uh, factory workers, for example, got fair treatment uh, from their employers, that farm workers got fair treatment from their employers. Um, he was against what were called the Enclosure Act. Um, now, Mary Wollstonecraft alluded to this in her piece, um, The Vindication of the Rights of Man. Um, enclosure was this process by which um, what used to be common land in English rural villages where anybody could graze their animals, where anybody could start a little garden plot, whatever, like a little, like kind of a village green in the middle of town, right? Um, the Enclosure Act set these, this land aside for private use by the aristocracy or by large landowners, who then started enclosing these village greens and filling them with livestock so that people in the rural villages could no longer use them for their own purposes, right? So in terms of the British, standing up for the British little guy, Cobbett was right there with him, right? But we see that there's this serious blind spot in his politics where he is not willing to stand up for the oppressed in other parts of the empire, right? In part because he is kind of unable to see past um, issues of nationality or skin color in order to um, you know, assert any kind of idea of universal human rights, right? Meanwhile, you know, William Wilberforce, the leading abolitionist of the day, um, was a rich guy who basically kind of ignored a lot of what went on in his properties or the factories that he owned, right? So Wilberforce's own attitudes are complicated. And this is one of the things that Cobbett hits him on, right, is that people like Wilberforce um, are crying about injustices done to people far away, but aren't paying any attention to what's being done on their own properties at home. Why does that sound so <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, like, the, these are strands of politics that are still with us, right? Um, these are issues that we're still grappling with. I mean, you know, like I remember, um, you know, in 2016, um, one of the big complaints um, about, uh, you know, say that Bernie Sanders' Democratic presidential campaign from the left, right, and you know, he's campaigning to Hillary Clinton's left, was that because he was so focused on issues of class, he tended to ignore how things broke down around uh, along racial lines when he was actually talking to people, right? He was actually discussing these issues, and that that hurt him in gaining traction with, uh, with black voters. Um, and yeah, um, we do still often see on the left uh, race as a kind of blind spot. Now, Cobbett isn't really a figure who is 100% of the left, or he's kind of too nationalist for that. Um, but he is someone who is very much focused on class issues. I would also, you know, that, you know a, 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 a comparison between William Cobbett and Bernie Sanders is probably an unfair one, right? Um, <clears throat> I'm just, you know, you know, trying to point out that some of these issues and blind spots persist in contemporary politics, right? 
So let's turn to a couple of the other essays here. Like, what did you make of the Thomas Clarkson piece? There are two parts to this. There's the imaginary conversation with, the, with an African, right? And then the second part of this is his description of a couple of slave ships and also of the, uh, the Zong incident of October 1781, right? What did you make of Clarkson's piece? Okay, why, why, why not? Like, what, what about it seemed off or unreal to you? Um, the way he spoke about it and, like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it is an imaginary conversation. It tells you right off that, you know, this is, you know, I made this up, right? Um, Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Um, it's exaggerated in a sense. Not really exaggerated because I'm sure that. Uh huh. Let me try to explain this. At the end, he mentions about playing on the reader's emotion. Uh huh. So he's, it's not actually exaggerating the fact that it's probably downplayed what actually happened. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, it's kind of, you know. Yeah, well, let, let, me, let me give you a word that might be helpful, right? Is he perhaps playing on the reader's yes. sensibility? Yes. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, right. And again, you know, like, remember the, the, the context of the era here, right? So this is all over the literature of the era, right? You know, this thing that you can affect people's like the people's morality is essentially built on emotional connection, right? What you want to do is use their sensibility, right? Use their sensitivity to um, impressions, sensory and emotional, and use that to generate sympathy, right? To try to make them feel the struggles of other people. that that way they might reform their behavior, right? So let's look at the arguments that sort of pass back and forth here between Clarkson and uh, his imaginary African correspondent, right? right? I shall suppose myself on a particular part of the continent of Africa and relate a scene which, from its agreement with unquestionable facts, might not unreasonably presume to have been presented to my view had I actually been there. And first, I will turn my eyes to the cloud of dust that is before me. It seems to advance rapidly, and accompanied with dismal shrieks and yellings, to make the very air that is above it tremble as it rolls along. What can possibly be the cause? I will inquire of that melancholy African who is walking dejected upon the shore, whose eyes are steadfastly fixed on the approaching object, and whose heart, if I can judge from the appearance of his countenance, must be greatly agitated. So what does this slave train appear as to Clarkson? This huge crowd. Well, do, does he even see a crowd? What does he actually see? A cloud of dust, right? He sees a cloud of dust. What does this indicate about how clear things look to him from his vantage point? Yeah, it's obscured, right? He can hear it. He can see something there, right? but he can't really see what's going on. 
thought about some of the metaphors for like how people in the human brain couldn't really see what was going on. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the cloud of dust and the distance, right, obscures what's really going on, right? Meanwhile, where are the Africans' eyes fixed? On something approaching, I guess, the ship. Uh, I don't know the object. Uh, Steadfastly fixed on the object approaching, on the cloud of dust approaching. So <clears throat> he is much more intensely aware of this than Clarkson is, right? His eyes are steadfastly fixed on it. Right. Alas, says the unhappy African, the cloud that you see approaching rises from a train of wretched slaves. They are going to the ships behind you. They are destined for the English colonies, and if you will stay here but for a little time, you will see them pass. They arrived here about two days ago from the inland country. I saw the fleet come in, which had gone to fetch them, and upon looking into the different canoes, found them lying at the bottom, their hands and feet being tied together. As soon as they were landed, they were conveyed to the houses of the black traders, which you see at a little distance, where they were immediately oiled and fed and made up for sale. So one of the things that he is referencing here um, is that, yeah, there was a long tradition of slavery and bonded labor in Africa as well, right? However, it didn't work quite the same way that the Atlantic slave trade did until European traders started showing up. Usually what happened was, uh, you know, captives would be taken in war um, and they could be ransomed by their own families or clans. Um, until that time, they were you know, kept in the villages where they, you know, the, the villages of the people who captured them. Um, you know, they did some, you know, did some work, but they didn't do any, any work that no one else was expected to do, right? Um, and uh, yeah, um, you know, this was kind of how the system proceeded. Now then, the Portuguese started showing up and paying chieftains in these villages lots of money for the slaves that they've captured, right? And giving them superior weapons, giving them guns, giving them alcohol, you know, giving them um, all of these European goods that can, on the one hand, you know, help give them an advantage over their neighbors, um, and also just sort of you know, make them rich and make them happy, right? So what happens then is that you get these kind of kidnap squads that start going around West Africa, just you know, kind of taking people and selling them to the white slave traders um, in exchange for goods. So that's what the, um, the imaginary African is here referencing, right? We then discovered the inhabitants of a depopulated village and all of them passed us and that the part of the train to which we were now opposite was a body of kidnapped people. Right? The fact that he uses the word kidnapped here is particularly important. Here we indulged our imagination. We thought we beheld in one of them a father, in another a husband, and in another a son, each of whom was forced from his various and tender connections and without even the opportunity of bidding them adieu. While we were engaged in these and other melancholy reflections, the whole body of slaves had entirely passed us. We turned almost insensibly to look at them again when we discovered an unhappy man at the end of the train who could scarcely keep pace with the rest. His feet seemed to have suffered much, either from the fetters which had confined them in the canoe or from long and constant traveling for which he was limping painfully along. So what is Clarkson trying to get us to do in this paragraph? How is he trying to get the reader to look at this passing slave train. Yeah, he is trying to engage your sympathy, right? And how is he trying to do that? By making you associate yourself with them. Yeah, by talking about the social and family roles that these people probably fill, right? There goes a father, there goes a husband, there goes a son, right? 
getting, getting you, you know, trying to get you to think of them as people rather than as abstractions, right? People who are taken from a particular context in which they belonged and then, you know, kidnapped and taken away <coughs> to a strange place. What's that? Yeah, give me an example. Uh, like, you, like you said, kidnapped and then yeah. um, a Jew, like, that's like goodbye forever, not just bye, but like bye forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a Jew is um, more intense than a regular goodbye. Yes, good. Um, so a little further down here, he also starts talking about religion. He starts talking about you know, Christianity and heathenism. And how do these two systems compare in this conversation? One is considered higher than the other. No, this is that's a superiority. OK. Inferiority. Which of these belief systems does the African regard as superior? Why? Uh huh. Yeah. What's what's his experience of Christians? He calls it a system of murder and oppression. Yeah, because that's what he sees, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the Christians as the bad guys, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely, right? And again, what like because you know what Clark Clarkson is trying to do is put you in that particular place, or you know, to explain what this person's experience of Christians must be, right? That, you know, these aren't people who come, you know, to spread joy and peace and love among his people. They're people who come to, to kidnap and who trade weapons for people, right? And yeah, to, ex to exploit them, yeah. So to him, Christianity looks like it must be a rotten system. And then he says, happy, happy heathenism. Yeah. Yeah, um, happy, happy heathenism, which can detest the vices of Christianity and feel for the distresses of mankind. Now, what Clarkson is attempting here is a kind of rhetorical move, right, to go after Christians like Cobbett, who are making their arguments based on scripture and based solely on tradition, right? and not on the kind of arguments about how you should feel for and how you should treat your fellow human beings. So Clarkson himself isn't making an argument against Christianity, right? He's just trying to show you what it would look like from the perspective of someone who has suffered at the hands of people who call themselves Christians. And then if we look at Clarkson's response here, but, I reply, you are totally mistaking Christianity. Uh, you are totally mistaken. Christianity is the most perfect and lovely of moral systems. It blesses even the hand of persecution itself and returns good for evil. But the people against whom you so justly declaim are not Christians. They are infidels. They are monsters. They are out of the common course of nature. Their countrymen at home are generous and brave. They support the sick, the lame, and the blind. They fly to the succor of the distressed. They have noble and stately buildings for the sole purpose of benevolence. They are, in short, of all nations, the most remarkable for humanity and justice. But why, then, replies the honest African, do they suffer this? Why is Africa a scene of blood and desolation? Why are her children wrested from her to administer to the luxuries and greatness of those whom they never offended? And why are these dismal cries in vain? Alas, I reply again, can the cries and groans which the air now trembles with which the air now trembles, be heard across this extensive continent? Can the southern winds convey them to the ear of Britain? If they could reach the generous Englishman at home, they would pierce his heart, as they have already pierced your own. He would sympathize with you in your distress. He would be enraged at the conduct of his countrymen and resist their tyranny. So what is Clarkson trying to tell the African here? Yeah. Yeah, it's like the only, 
The only reason people in England don't oppose this is because they don't know, right? How can we see what's going on from so far away? That cloud of dust, right? And then how does he go and undermine this idea immediately afterward? But here a shriek, unusually loud, accompanied with a dreadful rattling of chains, interrupted the discourse. What is he trying to suggest here? Yeah, well, the, the voice that yeah, the voice that the, the oppressed are speaking with, right, is the screaming and rattling of chains, right? But what is he trying to suggest about English people and their complicity in this? What's that? They don't want to. Yeah, it's like, like they don't want to see it, even if it was painted correctly yeah. for them. Yeah, the basic idea is they can fucking hear it, right? They know what's going on, but doing something about it would be inconvenient. So he's putting the lie to his own statement in the previous paragraph, right? That we just don't know. And if only we knew, then everything would be okay. We can connect that to Coleridge's arguments in his lecture. Right, what is Coleridge trying to get his audience to do. So this one he's talking about, um, like abstaining from sugar? Yeah. Essentially what he's doing here is proposing a sugar boycott, right? So what does it mean to boycott something? Yeah. So yeah, to boycott is to try to get a group of people together to abstain from purchasing a particular thing, right? And this is done for political purposes all the time, right? You know, I remember um, uh, a few years ago, right, uh, Bill O'Reilly uh, trying to get his viewers to boycott French wine, right? Um, you know, they're, they're, for a while, the people on the, the who were opposed to the Iraq War. Uh, suggested boycotting just one of the major oil companies um, to try to bring oil prices down um, to, to hurt them. Um, so yeah, so boycotts are often used for political purposes, right? And Coleridge's idea here is that if people will just give up this one little simple luxury, right? Right, this luxury is what the whole slave system of the West Indies is built upon. If you weren't so greedy for sugar, we wouldn't need these sugar plantations. They dry up, they go out of business. So, <clears throat> I want to look at the last paragraph of Coleridge's lecture, or at least the last paragraph that's printed here, um, because he's taking a different tack towards this idea of sensibility. Than Clarkson is. Okay, so page 117, there is observable among the many a false and bastard sensibility that prompts them to remove those evils and those evils alone, which by hideous spectacle or clamorous outcry are present to their senses and disturb their selfish enjoyments. Other miseries, though equally certain and far more horrible, they not only do not endeavor to remedy, they support, they fatten on them. Provided the dunghill be not before their parlor window, they are well content to know that it exists, and that it is the hotbed of their pestilent luxuries. So we actually can see there's, there's a, a similarity to some of what Clarkson was saying here, right? So Coleridge is, is to like, like that you know people know what's going on, right? But as long as they don't have to look at it or smell it, 
they ignore it. To this grievous failing, we must attribute the frequency of wars and the continuance of the slave trade. The merchant finds no argument against it in his ledger. The citizen at the crowded feast is not nauseated by the stench and filth of the slave vessel. The fine lady's nerves are not shattered by the shrieks. She sips a beverage sweetened with human blood, even while she is weeping over the refined sorrows of Berta or of Clementina. Sensibility is not benevolence. Nay, by making us tremblingly alive to trifling misfortunes, it frequently prevents it and induces effeminate and cowardly selfishness. Our own sorrows, like the princes of hell in Milton's pandemonium, sit enthroned bulky and vast, while the miseries of our fellow creatures dwindle into pygmy forms and are crowded an innumerable multitude into some dark corner of the heart. There is one criterion by which we may always distinguish benevolence from mere sensibility. Benevolence impels to action and is accompanied by self-denial. So why does Coleridge seem to think sensibility is not useful in changing people's behavior. What does he associate with sensibility? I mean, he sees it as like they're just feigning it, like it's not really compelling them to do anything. They just feel bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what, what sorts of things is he pointing to that induce sensibility? If we look at the, you know, the footnote, um, you know, the women weeping over the refined sorrows of Verta or of Clementina. What's the difference between the sorrows that are making this refined woman weep and the sorrows Coleridge is talking about? She sips a beverage sweetened with human blood, even while she is weeping over the refined sorrows of Verta or of Clementina. Was all those fictional characters? Yeah. Oh, okay. This is <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, um, this right. This is why footnotes are important, guys. And then like self denial. Um, mm -hmm. Like she doesn't. She's just ignoring that. Um, that it's wrong. Like not playing. Mm -hmm. To her sensibility, if I, if I that's the only thing I can kind of see. It's yeah. kind of ironic because uh -huh. in the book that she's reading, it's encouraging female leadership to pride the girls on their sensibilities. Uh -huh. But then again, at the same time, she's drinking tea with sugar, yeah. um, human blood, basically. It's like, yeah, it's like the. You, you know, that when you're cultivating sensibility, right, you're learning to feel all of these imaginary sorrows and these imaginary pains of people who don't fucking exist, right? While you ignore what's going on with actual living human beings, right? So his problem with sensibility is that he sees it as a literary or aesthetic or aesthetic practice rather than a moral one. Right? What's the idea that he opposes to sensibility? What does he suggest instead? What is better than sensibility? Benevolence. Benevolence, yeah. Sensibility encourages you, to, encourages you to feel things for people who never existed. Benevolence, he says, impels you to action, right? Benevolence is a kind of ethical sympathy. Right? You use 
your feelings for real people in real situations to do something rather than sitting back and crying about Clementina. Now Clarkson does do some of this as well. If we go to the second half of his essay, and this is going to be uh, where we're going to leave it today. So he describes an incident in October 1781. aboard a slave trading vessel called the Zom. So did you guys get a sense from this of what happened aboard the Zom, aboard the Zom and why? Okay, so what, what, is, what is this incident? What, what occurred here? Okay. Uh, yeah, he does, there's some mention made of sickness, right? But what's the what's what, what's the what's the action that's taken aboard the song? What happens there? Basically, because so many of the slaves were dying, received. Uh huh. He decided to throw them aboard or to help let the, let the slaves that he could throw each other. Board so that he could get like insurance. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, because, because of the, his losses. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. If they die, yeah, if they die of disease on the crossing, he can't sell them, right? So, um, yeah, uh, he throws people overboard, um, and he claims when the ship lands that he did so because there wasn't enough water, but. Clarkson calls that out as bullshit, right? Because, you know, there was plenty of rain at the time the ship was out, so there could not have been a lack of water. Now, what is, from a legal sense, the actual crime the captain commits? In a moral sense, what he's done, what he's done is murder, right? But in the sense of the British legal, in the eyes of the British legal system in 1781, what has he done? Yeah. Yeah, property. yeah, what he's actually charged with is insurance fraud. And this is the thing that outrages Clarkson about this, right? Now, one thing to note, like, and I think you know, this is also important as we think about um, Equiano and Mary Prince for next time, who are writing directly about their own experiences, is that the Zong incident uh, was only atypical in that the captain did this very clumsily and got caught. This kind of shit probably happened all the time. And people simply got away with it. Because this is the end result of viewing people as pieces of property rather than as human beings with rights and thoughts and feelings and needs, right? So a big thing that Equiano and Prince are going to be doing is trying for a British um, audience to um, put a human face on the problem, right? And to argue um, Equiano uh, very forcefully and very public ways. He actually undertakes what he, what, what's the, probably the first book tour in English literary history. Um, yeah, they're, they're really putting their own face on the problem. Okay, so I have some reading questions for next time. Um, and, you know, I, I will say to you, I, I, I do apologize if anything that we talked about today was emotionally distressing or upsetting. But I do think that these are extremely important contexts for discussing literature and for discussing history. Um, and that you know, we need to kind of approach these kinds of things with clear eyes. And there we go.